in this video we're going to go over the mean value theorem for integrals and let's say if we have some function which looks like this from a to b now there's some point c where the area under this region is equal to the area of the rectangle so I'm going to draw the rectangle in blue. So the area of that rectangle is equal to the area under the curve from A to B. And so if the function is continuous on the closed interval AB, and if C is in that interval, then according to the mean value theorem, the definite integral of f of x dx from A to B is equal to f of C, times b minus a. So the definite integral represents the area under the curve in red. So that's the definite integral. So it's the area of the curve and f of c times b minus a. b minus a represents the width of the rectangle and f of c, that's a y value, that represents basically the height of the rectangle. With times height, that gives us the area of the rectangle. So according to the mean value theorem, at some point c, the area of the rectangle is equal to the area under the curve. And f of c represents the average value. Now let's say that f of x is equal to x squared over the interval 0 to 4. Find the value of c guaranteed by the mean value theorem for integrals in this function. So let's start with a formula. So the area under the curve is equal to the area of the rectangle. So f of c times b minus a. Now a in this example is 0 and b is 4. So this is going to be the integral from 0 to 4, and f of x is x squared. f of c, well, if f of x is x squared, what is f of c? So if you plug in c into that equation, f of c is going to be c squared. And then we have b minus a, so that's going to be 4 minus 0. Now on the left, let's find the antiderivative of x squared. So using the power rule, it's going to be x cubed over 3 evaluated from 4 to 0. On the right, we simply have 4c squared. Now let's focus on the left side. If we plug in 4, it's going to be 4 to the third over 3. And then if we plug in 0, that's just going to be 0. Now, 4 to the third is 64. So we have this. Let's multiply both sides by 1 4 64 divided by 4 is 16. So 16 over 3 is equal to c squared. Now, let's take the square root of both sides. The square root of 16 is 4. So we have 4 over square root 3, and that's equal to c. But this is going to be plus or minus. Now, let's rationalize that value. The final answer is going to be plus or minus 4 square root 3 over 3. Now, to get a decimal value of that, this is plus or minus 2.309. Now, C has to be in the interval A to B, 0 to 4. Positive 2.309 is in that interval, but not negative uh, 2.309. So the C that we're looking for is positive 4 square root 3 over 3. And so this is the answer. Let's try another problem. Let's say that f of x is equal to the square root of x on the interval from 1 to 9. Go ahead and calculate the value of c for this problem. So let's start with the formula.
In this example, a is 1, b is 9. So we have the definite integral from 1 to 9. f of x is the square root of x. And f of c, all you got to do is replace x with c. So that's going to be the square root of c. And then b minus a, 9 minus 1. Now, let's replace the square root of x with x at 1 half because we need to rewrite it in order to integrate it. So using the power rule, 1 half plus 1 is 3 over 2. And instead of dividing it by 3 over 2, it's the same as multiplying it by 2 over 3. Let's evaluate it from 1 to 9. And then 9 minus 1 is 8. So on the left, we have 2 times 9 raised to the 3 over 2 over 3 minus 2 times 1 raised to the 3 over 2 over 3. And that's equal to 8 square root c. Now, what is 9 raised to the 3 over 2? How can we evaluate that fractional exponent? So anytime you have rational exponents, it's helpful if you split it. This is the same as 9 raised to the 1 half raised to the 3. When you raise one exponent to another, you need to multiply them. A half times 3 is 3 halves. So 9 to the half is basically the same as the square root of 9, which is 3. And 3 to the third is 27. So therefore, we have 2 thirds of 27, and then minus 2 thirds of 1. We can factor out two-thirds and make it easier. Or we could just multiply 2 and 27. 2 times 27 is 54. And then minus 2 or 3. 54 minus 2 is 52. And so right now, this is what we have. Now, what we need to do is divide both sides by 8, or multiply both sides by 1 over 8. So we could cancel these 8s. On the right, we could break down 52 into 13 times 4. And 8 is 4 times 2. And let's not forget the 3. So we could cancel a 4. And so we have 13 over 6 is equal to the square root of c. So now we need to take the square of both sides. 13 squared is 169. 6 squared is 36. And that's equal to c. Now, we need to make sure that it's in the interval a to b. In this problem, 1 to 9. So let's get the decimal value of 169 over 36. So as a decimal, that's about 4.694. So that's definitely in this interval. So this is the answer. Now let's say that f of x is a linear function, and let's say it's 2x plus 3 on the interval from 2 to 10. Now if you had to guess the value of c, what would you say? Now what is the midpoint of 2 and 10? To find the midpoint, we can average the two values. 2 plus 10 is 12, and 12 divided by 2 is 6. Do you think c will be less than 6, equal to 6, or greater than 6? Now for linear functions, the c value will be equal to the midpoint value. Now let's confirm it. So let's start with our original formula. And then let's plug in what we have. So a is 2 b is 10, f of x is 2x plus 3, and so f of c is going to be 2c plus 3, and then b minus a, that's 10 minus 2. Now the antiderivative of x is x squared over 2, and for 3 it's 3x, evaluated from 2 to 10. Now 2, I mean 10 minus 2 is 8. So now let's focus on the right side. We could cancel a 2. 
And so we have x squared plus 3x. If we plug in 10, that's going to be 10 squared plus 3 times 10. And then minus, we need to plug in 2, 2 squared plus 3 times 2. So all of that is equal to 2c plus 3 times 8. 10 squared is 100, and 3 times 10 is 30. 2 squared is 4, 3 times 2 is 6. A hundred plus thirty is one thirty, and four plus six is ten. And one thirty minus ten is one twenty. So now let's divide both sides by eight. So what's one twenty over eight? Think of one twenty as eighty plus forty. And eighty divided by eight is ten. 40 divided by 8 is 5, so 120 divided by 8 is 15, and that's equal to 2c plus 3. Now, let's subtract both sides by 3. So 15 minus 3 is 12, and that's equal to 2c. And so if we divide by 2, we can see that c, in this example, is 6, and 6 is the midpoint of AB, which is 2 to 10. And so for a linear function, the C value, where the area of the rectangle is equal to the area under the curve, is simply the midpoint of AB. Now, let's compare the three problems that we had. So the first one was x squared, which looked like this. The second one was the square root of x, which looks like that on the right side of the graph. This is just the, the right half of x squared. And this is the graph for the square root of x. And for the third one, 2x plus 3, it looks like that. So for x squared, the interval was from 0 to 4. And for the square root of x, we went from 1 to 9. And then for, this was 2x plus 3, we went from 2 to 10. Now the midpoint of 0 and 4 is 2. And for 1 to 9, it's 5. And for 2 to 10, it's 6. Now the c value for this one was to the right of 2. It was 2.309. Now for the second graph, it was to the left of the midpoint, and c was 4.694. And for the last one, c was equal to the midpoint, it was equal to 6. So the c value guaranteed by the mean value theorem, it's going to be equal to the midpoint if you have a linear function, where it's neither concave up or concave down. On the left, we have an increase in function that's concave up. And in that case, c is going to be greater than the midpoint. But for a function that's increasing and concave down, c, as we can see, is less than the midpoint. But if it's linear and it's neither concave up or down, c is equal to the midpoint.